Good morning, you beautiful creative powerhouses. Uh, yeah, my name's Chris. I'm the co-founder of Victor Athletics and Noble Denim. Uh, I'm really excited to talk this morning, and I'm really honored to be uh, considered to talk about ethics, because um, I, I believe in it. I uh, feel like our brands uh, are built on it, and so I'm glad someone uh, took note and asked us to speak. So thanks. Thank you, Jeremy. Um, ethics is really important to me. I feel like it's been the key motivator uh, to make the things I create uh, more um, meaningful and I think more productive. When I was in college several years ago, bless you, me and my, uh, my best friend Andre, we, we were kind of dreamers when it came to creative things. We thought that all the great uh, artists kind of walked into their studios with, with no boundaries. You know, the Pablo Picasso's walked in and just kind of didn't know where he was going to go that day and just kind of threw it out there. Um, Dave Matthews Band, um, just brilliant. Um, and so we, we had all these things that we wanted to do. We wanted to be uh, artists, we wanted to be painters, we wanted to be musicians. Andre we wanted to write a children's book, which he actually has been doing, which is awesome. Um, and we really thought that what created good things was uh, no boundaries. So that was our big, our big thing. Um, I found myself often frustrated because I didn't know where to start. Um, I didn't know uh, really what, what the guide rails were because I didn't think I should have them until later on in life when I realized that I really needed some direction. Um, I had a crazy whim to learn how to make a pair of jeans. I didn't know how to sew. I didn't know anything about garment manufacturing, uh, but it sounded fun. And so I started making jeans in my apartment in Over the Rhine, and I really fell in love with this process of, of making something. Um, and about a year later, that turned into a business, Noble Denim. And when, when this business started, one of the very first things we did is me and our, my co-founder, Abby, and a guy I went to college with, Sam um, and Chrisman, that the, all the co-founders, we, we talked about the things that um, were important to us as individuals, the core foundations that we wanted this brand to be built on. Um, we decided that it was made in America. We really believe strongly in, in building into a local economy, uh, but we said local can be America. So pretty expansive, but still hard to do. We wanted to really strive for sustainable materials. Um, things that were organic or sustainably grown. Um, we, what was our other one? And fair wages. Uh, what we found out is just making something in the States didn't necessarily mean uh, it was made uh, well or that people were even getting paid well. So we wanted to make sure that the people that we were working with actually got paid fair wages. And these were the ethics, the guide rails, the really strong walls that were not gonna be moved. And what I realized is, as soon as I had those, uh, I found myself way more productive and I knew where my course was because I knew things that weren't gonna shift. Um, every decision we made with Noble always butted up against those, always um, were refined by those and it was the lens that we did everything. Um, I think we live in a wild time where like this morning I could have an idea it could be anything, and I can uh, put it on social media, and by this evening, uh, the world can, can know that idea, and they can start imitating it. So we see this all the time. I see it on Instagram a lot, because I like that uh, social media platform more than other ones. Um, I don't know who the first person was who like took a picture of an ice cream cone in front of like a, a you know, like a plain wall, like holding it beautifully. Um, but I could, I could come up with that idea of like, oh, here's a new cool f like, uh, idea for a picture. I can put it up on Instagram and by this evening, I can be like 
uh, imitated around the world and immediately from like idea to saturation is like instantaneous. Um, and so we're kind of constantly as people trying to stay relevant, trying to stay current, trying to come up with new ideas. Um, and I think for us, I, I often sit around and, and wonder like, how are we gonna like stay uh, evolving, stay interesting? And I think the core through line for us is our ethic. Um, I can come up with new ideas as far as the kind of the flesh on the bones, but the skeleton will always be what drives us, what our soul is as a brand and as uh, us as people. And I think that's how we can see a brand start here, which was me, a one man gene maker in Cincinnati, go from a, a couple brands. And now I think we have, we have eight employees. I think we do. I should know these things. <laughs> I'm the creative one uh, in the business, so I don't know our employee numbers. Um, and, and to be able to see the through line of, of it being with one person and then eight people and, and two businesses and people step back and say like, oh, I, I see the consistency here. And though like our photography styles have changed, though some of our aesthetics have changed, the thing that has kept us on that trajectory of, oh, it makes sense is that we've always been built on the same foundation. And that's been super uh, key to us. Um, you know, it's not always easy to do it with these rules. The other month, our co-creative director, Sam, and I were in Los Angeles. And we're developed, we developed this new brand, Victor, where it's all organic, uh, like, athletic wear. So, like, t-shirts, sweatshirts, like, vintage athletic wear, not like Lululemon, but like Rocky Balboa style, you know? Um, and we said, okay, everything's going to be organic, everything's going to be made in the States, and that's going to be like our, that, those are our pillars. Um, so we walked into this uh, mill that's known for making great t-shirt material, and we were in this room, um, it's about the fourth of the size of this room, and it was just filled with fabric swatches of just t-shirt material, thousands, thousands of them. And they gave us like an hour and we're digging through all these and we're finding all this cool stuff, these really cool patterns and textures. And then um, one of the employees walks in, we said, so which ones of these are organic? And she pulled four swatches, four of them. Here's, here's the organic uh, options that we have. And like two of them were just straight shitty fabrics right off the get go, so we couldn't even go there. Um, so we had two to look from, and I, I had like two responses. One of them is like, oh man, I wish we could just like scrap this organic thing and go with like all of this cool stuff. This is like, it's so much easier for everybody else. Um, and then taking a step back, it's like, oh, this is kind of awesome. You know, I mean, it's not awesome, but let's, <laughs> maybe we have, maybe we can make something that hasn't been done. Maybe we can take, um, well, that t-shirt material is really cool, but it's not organic. What would it look like to make something like that inorganic? And all of a sudden, now we have something new. And I think that if we, if we have strong guide rails and we have a problem that we need to solve, I think that's where we can actually innovate with things because we can say, okay, I'm not going to break this boundary, I'm not going to break this boundary, but I'm still going to try to solve this issue, and so I'm going to do it within this realm of things that work for me. And so we've been, we're on our third fabric that we've been able to produce from the ground up. It's been super cool. We've been able to go to factories that take cotton, organic cotton, and see it spun into threads and then talk to knitters to get it knit. And without, without that uh, guide rail of organics, I don't think I would have known this whole process. So now we can dissect a t-shirt and know what makes not just a great sustainable t-shirt, but a really cool fabric, one that looks really old school, that performs really well. Um, and it actually an ethic helped us become, I think, more interesting um, in the fabrics that we've made. When we started with uh, Noble, we wanted to be all American made. It was really important to us. And it, it's not that you can't make good clothes overseas. I think there's great brands that make stuff overseas. Not everything overseas is like child labor and slave labor. You can make things ethically overseas. So I'm not uh, shitting on outsourcing necessarily. Um, sorry for my language. But, um, 
But American Made was important to us. It was a core that we really wanted. We wanted to see American factories thrive. And people would often say to us, like, it's cheaper overseas. It's like, it's cheaper, but we're not gonna do it. But your clothes are really expensive. And so we stepped back and said to ourselves, you know, our clothes being expensive isn't an ethic. It's not a value. Like, they are expensive, uh, but that's, that's like a bound, that's something we're willing to like work with. So we sat down as a team and we said, okay, American made, that's not changing. So that kind of comes with a price tag of what our manufacturing costs are. But our retail price is uh, movable. Um, direct to consumer has been growing. Obviously, we did not create that model, but we said, man, we could, we could be the first organic American-made uh, clothing company that is direct to consumer, um, and that can cut our costs in half. And so now we're competitive with J. Crew pricing, um, and then we created Victor Athletics to fit that void. Again, um, if we didn't have if we didn't have these boundaries of what we weren't willing to change, I don't think we would have been um, as flexible and, and creative and innovative within that. Um, I think the brands that I'm really inspired by, when I look at them, it's uh, Patagonia is like number one. There's a brand called Hyatt Denim. Uh, Kinfolk Magazine. Um, what the, the through line for me, um, when, I, when I step back, when I've kind of dissected, what is it about these brands that gives me like an emotional response? Something that I'm drawn to more than, oh, that's cool. Something drawn to more than like, I just want to like share this on Facebook. But something that when I, I read their about section, which I, about sections are always shitty. But when I read Hyatt Denim's about section, I was like, inspired, I actually was like, the world could be like a better place <laughs> by an about section on a website, you know? Um, and what it was is there were these uh, touch points of they're doing things in a different way. They're doing things driven by a different ethos than just making a cool product, um, doing something interesting, pushing the envelope. And all of these brands have been built around this soul of, um, we're gonna stay true to ourselves. We're gonna be built on, if it's sustainability for Kinfolk Magazine, their, uh, their ethos has always been slow living um, and doing things in like a slow, methodical, rhythmic way. And so in the beginning, their, uh, their photography is very like kind of hipster, like reclaim wood. And now you look at the pictures and it's like very like kind of uh, uh, Japanese-y, Denmark, uh, minimalistic. Uh, I, I don't look at, them anymore and say, oh, like they've really like um, veered off in this weird direction. I've actually thought they've stayed completely consistent, though their images have been totally different. I think the reason why is their, the story they've told, the heartbeat behind their brand has always been the same from day one to day, I don't know, four years old or something like that. And that's really inspiring to me. Um, chasing trends, tracing relevancy, uh, chasing new ideas. Uh, I think is fine, but the things that I'm really drawn to, the kind of work that I really strive to do is pairing those ideas, fun projects with something that really matters and is meaningful. Um, and those for us have been uh, core, core lines that we've drawn in the sand. Uh, they're different for everybody, but what I've found is a common denominator for things that I inspire to be like um, is that that ethic is there. Um, that's pretty much what I have to say, and I'd love to open it up for any Q&A uh, if y'all have anything you want to ask. Do you have any sort of process, or what process do you go through to kind of land on those three core attributes? Yeah. Yeah, that's a good question. A lot of it was what the founders were into. So um, eating organically was a big one. That was like a common denominator for all of us. Um, we really decided like we want, as like someone who started making clothes, I really wanted to know the people making clothes. So I didn't feel like I had to make them all myself, but I didn't want to have to fly to China to, to meet people that we may not speak the same language. Um, so actually like, having a relationship with factories was really important. 
So a Made in America was really an obvious choice. Um, so it was kind of after we put, a, there was other things that didn't make the list, but those were the ones that we could all agree, like we're all passionate about these, so much so that like every decision from here to when this brand, whatever, the, every decision will be made through that lens. Yeah. 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 Um, I feel the I get the views and they're all in the fashion photos all the time. So I'm like, I'm gonna ask them what what advice would you give them to They wanna get into fashion? Yeah. Wow. Sometimes I would say don't get into fashion. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and sometimes I would say, yeah, go for it. I wouldn't consider myself in like in the fashion world necessarily, because like this isn't really fashion. I mean, this is just like, it's all denim. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's nothing like, uh, man, I think everyone's getting into it for different reasons. I got into it because I loved making the clothes and then I loved the idea of manufacturing. So that was like what, that was my entry point and that's different than a lot of people. Um, but what I would say is uh, I would tell them to find ways that they can cultivate that on their own for free uh, for as long as possible. Because I think that that's like a perfect like building ground and foundation that they can do. And so maybe that's like learning how to sketch well. Maybe that's researching online. Um, but I think there's a lot of ways they can build into themselves. I, I, I wish I, I, I almost pushed too hard for like, um, wanting to like be in like GQ magazine or something and it's just kind of bullshit and, and not important. Um, and I think maybe those things will come, um, but there's a lot we can do like kind of uh, without putting ourselves out there first. Yeah. 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 It was a Yeah, when did it go from like a hobby to a business? I, I started sewing in like July. Six months later, I left my job. Um, and then six months later, I started a business. Yeah, so I guess, I just like, I just loved it. I just like really loved it. Uh, I started sewing and at first it was not, they weren't very good jeans, um, but I think my, fourth pair I gave to my brother-in-law and like he's like into clothes like he he wouldn't wear something that was bad and he like wore them and liked them um and he had like just bought a pair of expensive jeans and liked mine better and I was like all right that that was like the uh that was like the big affirmation I needed that it was working but mainly it was just it was I just loved doing it and I I, it was that, it's cheesy, but like, man, if I could do this thing for a job, I'd really be happy. Uh, so that was it, yeah. Yeah. Can you talk about how you found your manufacturers? Yeah. And then what it's like, you're talking about like the kinfolk aesthetic, you're talking about all these different aesthetics, and you're probably working with manufacturers who know, have no clue what kinfolk is or what, uh -huh. what you're going for. How do you keep your vision when you're working for people? And I think it's in Tennessee, but how do you, yeah. how do you keep that? Yeah. How'd you find them? So we're working with multiple factories, but I'll talk about Tennessee first. Uh, super random. We made a video early on, um, me making jeans by myself. You've never seen a video of a one man person making anything before, I'm sure. And um, I got an email from a guy who said he uh, lives in Tennessee, lives in this small town, there's a factory. He's like, I think they used to make jeans. Do you want their number? Um, I was like, all right, yeah. Like, it was right around the time Abby and I were, were talking about um, wanting to potentially look into other people making them with us. So we drove down there. We, we, we went to two factories on that trip. Um, one of them, I, again, like kind of just randomly heard about, but these people don't have websites. They're like so technologically like 
unadvanced uh, when it comes to like social, they, there's like no marketing, you know, it's like phone book days. Um, so we drove down there. Um, I took a pair of jeans that I made and then I took a pair of jeans that I thought were like, in my mind, they're like world's best jeans. And um, we talked, I saw the way they looked at the jeans. They immediately turned them inside out, which is always a good sign. Cause it's like, how are these made? Then I spent a lot of time down there. I spent um, probably a couple uh, probably a couple months total. Um, I stayed at the sewing machine mechanic's house, and then every day I just would go in there, and I was just a hard ass. But also, like we had like would go bowling together and eat dinner. So they got to know me, but they also knew like this is what I really want, um, and they owned it for themselves. So a lot of training to get them th with the aesthetics that I wanted, because they could sew, but yeah, they, they weren't, they used to sew like uh, t-shirts for the brand Bum, you remember that? The big B-U-M, uh, and like Carhartt sweatshirts. Like, like they know how to do good construction, but not things that were like blowing my mind aesthetically. Um, so it was just a lot of time spent with them. Um, and then every other factory, it's kind of the same process. Getting to know them, um, getting to see if they like love this, uh, and like love the product. If they do, then they get excited about learning new things. Yeah. Yeah. I'm thankful that we haven't run into ethical dilemmas with financing, uh, but it hasn't made like financing easy either. You know, we've run into other dilemmas like finding financing. Um, a lot of it, um, friends and family in the beginning, um, then a few select individuals that like came along that caught the vision. Um, it's all been a mix of like low interest loans mixed with some equity stuff, but we haven't like, we've mainly given equity away to uh, like mainly sweat equity, uh, like employees essentially that we couldn't pay for a while were the ones that I always wanted to give our equity to more than uh, like investors. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yes and no. Everyone likes the story. You know, oh, that's so like cool. Those are such, I, I eat organic too. Like it's really important to me. And then, oh shit, your manufacturing costs to do it this way are really high. Have you thought about, it like immediately breaks down, you know? It's like we're hungry and McDonald's is right there. I'm going, you know? Yeah, so, uh, you know, nine out of 10 investors probably like, oh, I think these ethics are really beautiful. And then like, I don't want to give money to these things. Um, there are those people out there. I haven't had like thousands of conversations. Um, we're, we're looking for, we have like a, there's, we're kind of about to go into that process now, um, which is something that I hate doing and I also love what we're doing. So it's like a, the whole like pitch and like that whole thing is, it's a mixed bag. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. buy this product. And so how do you like approach that kind of struggle, you know, people who really like what you're doing but can't necessarily afford the product that's really out there? Yeah. Maybe it's as simple as like instead of buying five shitty shirts, buy one really nice one. But yeah. you know, how do you make that change? I don't try to convince anyone to buy our jeans. Um, they are expensive. Like with the amount of money I make, I couldn't like maybe naturally afford them. Um, but I can make decisions around it. So I've done that with other brands in the past. Um, yeah, like, oh, what's our finances like if I save $10 a month for a long time? I'll eventually be able to buy these. Um, Victor, our new brand, was an attempt to make things more approachable. Um, not that like J. Crew is cheap, because I actually used to think J. Crew was like really expensive, but for American made, that was like the line to me of like, that would be like a affordable for American made stuff. Um, so we created a brand to try to make it approachable. Um, and at the same time, 
the goal of Noble is not to make something accessible necessarily. The goal is to make something as literally as well and as excellent as we possibly can. Um, I wish it could be cheaper, um, but I'm definitely like unapologetic that it is super expensive. Um, and if someone emailed, emailed me and said, I'm a college student that can't afford your jeans, I'd probably give them a huge discount. So yeah, email me. Not all of you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, how did you, I guess, grow your brand and market your product um, from the beginning of you just making your jeans to having this being a big so far? Yeah. Because um, I think it's really hard to grow a brand in the beginning with a market that's so oversaturated with so many brands. Um, so, like, how did you go from just you to now having this being a big and then grow the brand so much? Yeah. A lot of trial and error because I wouldn't say it was like a super efficient process over the last three and a half years. Um, I mean, social media is like a is like the cheapest. It's social media is weird because it's like oversaturated. Everybody's doing it and it still works. So that's a that's for us. It was I think learning the platform that made the most sense for us. Instagram was the one. I don't like, I don't get Twitter, I like read it, but I don't know how to tweet very well. And I don't have, I'm not like a words guy when it comes to writing things, but I'm making stuff. So like, here's a picture of me cutting out jeans. Here's a picture of this leather patch I made. Um, and people love behind the scenes stuff. So it was free to do that. And I realized like if I was consistent with it, um, as in like, taking like one to two pictures a day and making them look generally um, aesthetically pleasing. Like that, that was probably the biggest thing. That and then um, I had some friends that like helped me with some photography and some videos, putting them up online. Um, and then a lot of it is just putting yourself out there. So it's emailing GQ and blogs and um, we got like just no responses for a long time. And then eventually they kind of started like, yeah, I'll, I'll write about that. Uh, I'm a firm believer that the world is way smaller than we all think it is. And if putting ourselves out there and asking for things um, with like warmth and relationship like does pay dividends. Um, and so then that slowly just started, everything just kind of slowly started trickling. There was never like a, oh, that I used to think like, oh, the minute we're in X blog, that's where the sales just explode. We've been in like 15 of those and there's been no explosions. <laughs> there's, it's been trickles and it's been good, but uh, it's all been just like kind of steady. What can I do consistently over time? It will eventually build up. Does that answer your question? Yeah. yeah. From size 28 to 36, it's one, two, <laughs> one, two, three, four, five. And then 37 to 40, we put two extra ones right here instead of one. So six. Yeah. How many would you like? I would like six on a size 34. Yeah. Do you like the kind of the two in the back? Okay. It kind of pulls up weird. Yeah. You might need tighter jeans. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's a good question. Victor. Yeah. Well, the original brand name was Billy Kidzilla for the jeans. No joke. <laughs> Uh, it was a terrible idea, but <laughs> it was fun. Um, I, I wanted a name that was simple, that uh, had some weight to it. I liked the, the word noble because it, it it's not used very often, but it, you know, it like means like a noble like, is to like do something well and do something with uh, ethics, is to do something that, that is um, like thoughtful and intentional. Um, and it's like a strong name. Um, but it wasn't overplayed, um, like a lot of words that have some weight to them. Um, yeah, so that was it. I, liked it. I like one word names. That's just me. 
Um, and so Victor, when we created Victor, we kind of had the similar thought process. Um, wanted to be like easy to remember, wanted to be strong. Um, obviously the URL, like that whole battle is like one of the main like drivers and name picking is just, is it available? Um, I thought Victor was kind of interesting because it's like a, a person's name, but it's like the Victor, it's like Victory, but in like, I've never seen that just like cut off there before as like a normal name. Um, so kind of did the same thing. Felt like it was strong. It played into the athletics kind of vibe um, and the URL was available. Yeah. Yeah, Christoph, I have a question about your creative content. Yeah. Put online. Um, so the, the video that you just talked about that you did with the just alone in your shop um, was great. I liked it a lot. Um, and it was actually some inspiration that I did for, for projects that I did because I'm a freelancer. Oh, sweet. Who works with small and mid sized businesses like yourself. Yeah. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I think this is like a very like personal, I think we probably all do this different, but for me there's kind of this, uh, I, I, I start kind of feeling the rumblings of like an idea aesthetically of what I want to do. Um, and I'll, oftentimes I like, can like immediately envision it in my mind of like, this is how I want it to look and feel and, and all this. If it's like a photo shoot, for instance. Uh, Pinterest is a big one for me. Private boards, I'm not like a big like, look at my pins, but I, I like the private board thing. Then what I do is I go and I be, I'm very unexclusive and I just pin anything that's got like just a, I'm like trying to like mind map trying to take my mind map and like make it onto something. So there might be like a hundred pins and some of them might be like dumb, but it's like, it's not, it's not that picture. It's like the movement of that person and I want the movement. And then I feel like a lot of times I can't articulate until like I look over it and it's like, oh, the color palette is definitely like desaturated. I wouldn't have like said that in the beginning, but after just throwing all of this stuff that just kind of feels right, I can see it. And then I can, I start honing it in then I'll, I'll trim those down to like the top 10 that feel right. And then I'll like share it with a photographer. Um, I've been working now with photographers where, where I know like, oh, that guy, do you guys know Michael Wilson? He's a photographer in town. He's the best, he's the best person. Uh, and if you need a photographer that's just got the heart of like gold, Michael Wilson, I mean, he's shot anyway, BB King, uh, he's the man. Anyway, like I know him now and it's like, oh, Michael's like a really like offbeat, all does black and white film. It's all kind of gritty. When we were thinking of Victor, we wanted like gritty, kind of like we were looking at like photography of like Brooklyn in the 60s. It's like, oh, Michael Wilson's photography portfolio already does that. Now we'll kind of steer him in like 10% of direction. Uh, sometimes I used to uh, get a photographer that was just a good photographer but they were not really in the style I was going for. And so it was just like way too much work to get them there. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah? yeah. All right. That's all over the place. It's, it's hard to do, I guess, is to cr communicate that. The more I know it myself and the more I can point someone with some visuals, it helps. Great. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. So we're starting the naming process right now. Cool. Suggestions for us as artists. <sighs> like from what angle? Um, like materials. Like <laughs> because getting started is really weird. Like yeah. Are you guys making the pants? Yeah. So like efficiency as far as sewing or like the business side of things? The hardest thing is that there's like a thousand important things to focus on. 
Um, no, no, uh, I would say no, your, those guide rails. I really would. Again, that was like day one was like, what are like the values that we're going to hold? Um, Cause I think that until you do that, you're just going to be like, unless naturally you're a very focused person. I think, um, I think all like great brands and great products um, have meaning. And I think that if, if you know what those are, you're going to make something good. Yeah. It's normally to, it's anything with pockets is to make your butt look a certain way. Yeah. People think women, like small pockets makes your butt look smaller. But you know, the, sh the tide is shifting to bigger pockets on women's jeans. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> We do. We're developing them right now. Yeah. Um, the sample was overnighted to us today. Uh, we're in like the third sample round. They're looking awesome, and I'm super excited about them. Um, but they're not out yet. But they're like legit women's jeans. They're stretchy. They're, they're like have, we have different washes. A lot of like American-made jeans companies get into women's jeans, but they just try to get women into like, weird looking men's jeans. We're not going that route. They're women's jeans. <laughs> yeah, one more question. Yeah. Yeah, man. Yeah, uh, it all starts with what we want to wear. Um, so I bought this j jacket six months ago, seven months ago, and I wear it probably every single day. I love it. Um, and so I want to make a denim jacket because it's like, man, this is like a staple. I love denim jackets. And so um, it normally doesn't come from like, and this isn't a bad way to do it, but I don't normally like pull people and be like, what do you guys want? Um, but also we're making very simple things. Like I'm, I want to make like a really good button up shirt. I want to make a really good jacket. Um, like core items, chinos, you know, I'm, I'm sick of wearing jeans all the time uh, since I have so many of them. So I want to make another good style pant. Um, but maybe I'll get your guys' pant if it's a chino. Let's talk. Um, so it comes, that's where it comes from. Yeah, and then the aesthetic choices is again, a lot of it's driven by fabrics. I normally, especially with like the guide rails of organic, what's out there, um, then what could we make from that? Um, and a, there is some really cool stuff and that often will inspire me. So we found this like chambray, this great uh, shirt material that's organic. So that was like a, man, we could, we could make a really cool shirt with that. Um, yeah. Thanks. Oh yeah, we have a store in town, Victor Athletics Club. We opened that uh, right before Christmas, uh, 1405 Republic Street in over the Rhine, right like between Vine Street and uh, Washington Park. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Yeah, man. Thanks, guys.